Okay, we're immediately back. We were looking at stats, the very first uh, part about stats. I'm hoping I'm not going too slow, but I also don't want to freak some people out if they're not used to looking at statistics. Uh, if you are, fast play, <laughs> I guess. So what measure of spread should we be using in these cases? So right here, it looks normally distributed. You can actually test for normally distributed data, whether it's normally distributed. I'd say it's normally distributed. I would say you can use the standard deviation. You can use your average. How about this? It looks about normally distributed. Oh, wait, it's colors. It makes no sense to do any kind of measure of spread. I can do the mode to figure out the most common color, orange or purple, if they seem to be the same. But that's about it. Uh, there's no spread at all. Uh, number of errors. I can compensate for the fact it's a skewed, positively skewed distribution. I can compensate for it, but as it is now, without that compensation, I have to use the median. It is not normally distributed, it's skewed. And then with the salary, unless I get rid of this outlier, I better use a median, right? The median distribution and then, and then use a interquartile range because this thing is way off. It's throwing all my numbers off. The standard deviation does not make sense because what you're going to find out is the people that got this score here are below the average. They're one standard deviation below the average. If my exam looks like this, they'll get their mark back and I say this is what the average is. They'll look at their mark and say, oh, I got this score, but the I'm below the average. Oh my God, time to panic. Heck, they, the person that did better than the average would say, you know, the actual you know, average would say, oh my God, I did, I did only at the average. Oh my God, I'm, I'm failing the course. This is why you have to know what the stats are supposed to do. So again, the data type and the distribution dictates what tests you can do and whether a particular test makes any sense whatsoever. Is it mean meaningful? Yeah, yeah, see, uh, uh, bad dad joke. Um, does it make sense or should you be doing some other uh, test? What about a vector distance? Does that make sense if I have a non-normally distributed uh, data set? If I have something that's not normally distributed, the stats actually become it, the, the ability to actually prove something statistically or provide evidence statistically that something is true is extremely difficult or it's more difficult at least. And so this is when you're doing any kind of data mining, that's something that comes up from time to time. Uh, for example, what if I've, uh, what do I mean if two songs are similar? We'll see that. So here is a, an actual experiment, an actual uh, project I did. I love this project. It looks like crap nowadays. Like the from from a from a graphics and from a programming standpoint, this is what I did in the first year of my PhD, and it's like, oh, that's really tacky, and oh, I, I made some assumptions. I made all sorts of mistakes. But I think the the genesis of the idea and the foundational principle that we're dealing with is still sound after the, all this time and I still want to keep doing this research so um, what if we have two songs and we're trying to say that they're similar so here is the party boat jukebox system the idea here is that we have my entire music playlist so I had you know 4,000 songs in a, pu in a music playlist or in, in my music collection if I position this music in a two-dimensional space based on song metadata and sound similarity, we analyze the sound itself and pull out key features of the sound itself. The, I think it's only the first 100 seconds of the song or something like that, but close enough. And we also look at, so we have, we do a, an analysis of the sound, the, the, the sound wave itself, and we also do an analysis of the metadata itself. Both of those add, are part of the score. Hold on. Hold on. Uh, there we go. If the idea here is for party vote is this. Each person chooses one song at the party. This actually dictates a convex hull. So what we end up getting is we get a bunch of points, hopefully. There we go. And I choose this song, someone chooses this song, someone chooses this song, someone chooses this song, and someone chooses this song. Let's put some more dots around here. And what we have is if this determines the space around which acceptable music 
can be played. Anything in this area is acceptable. Okay. And then we weight the songs based off of the proximity to one of these voted for songs. So the songs around this area, here, 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 are weighted more. Weighted more. So songs in the area are, are playable, but you will emphasize if there's a whole bunch of votes, let's put another vote over here, then this area is a whole lot more weight than the other areas. Songs near popular music are more likely to be played, but each person is guaranteed at least one song. That's the idea behind this system. Allow people at a party, so you have a bunch of people just hanging out, drinking beer, whatever the case, at a party, and they're wanting to play music. And you're trying to get everyone to be, have a say in the music, because most of the times when you go to a party, it's like the host of the party makes a playlist, and you're not sure if everyone's gonna like the music. Who gets to ultimately decide? It's some music snob, or is it just the average everyday person, the person that breaks into the other person's room and plays music? And so this is meant to be a democratic, vote-based music selection system for social gatherings. The concept seems to be fine. At least I have not found evidence suggesting that it was not working as an idea. The people were the problem. They're not really the problem, there's just more nuance than I thought. We made the system so that you visualized the, the, what people were voting for so you could strategically vote and choose music that so you can weight music that was similar to, if, like, if you have four songs you might want to choose, and one of them is closer to a bunch of other songs you also sort of like, choose the song that's closer to other songs you might like, because it's going to weight that area and you're going to play music, more music that you like. You can make intelligent choices based off of how other people voted, and therefore you can buy, you can, um, you keep things in, into con and you can try and maximize the power of your vote. But on top of that, seeing other people's votes means that if someone's cheating or trying to game the system, everyone else can you know, slap them down. The idea, if, you can, if you're accountable for your vote because other people can see it, social norms will constrain behavior. Here's the weird thing. Uh, people didn't trust how their vote impacted things. And they also didn't, it, it didn't constrain social behavior because they knew each other, this, at least the group I was studying, knew each other well enough to not care whether they pissed off all their friends because their friends already knew that they didn't like the same kind of music and therefore they were like, hey, hey, hey. It became a little bit of a toy and a little bit, um, I'm not sure if social norms would have established around this. But one of the big things that all these people I was talking to, and they were, they were engineers using this system, they kept on not trusting what their vote was doing because they didn't believe how that you could take music and fit it into a two-dimensional space. How is it that you have some complicated music, like music, it, how is Tori Amos related to Nine Inch Nails, right? Or how is, is where do you put some kind of, let's say, EDM or act? Is it in dance music? Is it under this? Is it pop? Is it, what, what is it? EDM, electronic dance music, by the way. So how is it that you fit into the space? And, oh wait, no matter what you do, someone's going to disagree with your your assertion of how this music space is being defined. So let's go into dimensionality reduction a little bit, just a little bit. So this, uh, this is an area where you can deep dive, you can spend your entire life just exploring this particular area. But it is the idea that we're doing here, which is I have music, I have information about a sound, like the, the, the frequency analysis, the fast forward frequency analysis of the song. And you can extract the number of beats per minute and the tempo and, um, and the beat impact, how, how thumpy the bass is or what the treble versus the bass ratio is, things like that. Features of the song like that. And you can also look at the song metadata, like the length of the song, what album it's on, who the artist is, all of which would be, make an impact of how similar it is, because one Coldplay song should be related to another Coldplay song, even if their, their style of music has changed radically. Radiohead's a classic example of this. All radio, no, Radiohead songs don't necessarily sound alike, but they're just, they, they should be related to one another. Okay, so here's the idea. I have this really high dimensional space for, to describe any given song. How do I represent it in two dimensional space or three dimensional space or n dimensional space? 
And that's what we're going to look at today because it comes up when it comes to data analysis. So, um, so how do you reduce dimensions, first of all? And um, why do you need to reduce dimensions? Well, one of them is you might be, want to display them on the screen. But the other part might be maybe I want to find patterns. That's part of machine learning as well, actually. This dimensional scaling is part of what a lot of machine learning algorithms do. And what kind of guidelines do we have? More importantly, how do people interpret those da these data to make me uh, and do they trust what what's happening? So if I'm doing an analysis and I want to visualize uh, a data set, the dimensionality scaling actually change or it actually changes how I interpret the data. So if I have this is a number of features of songs from 2000, uh, 1922 to 2011 and including like um, the, the hashtags on the label, the uh, timber, uh, we also have like the base and a bunch of other factors in there. And we also have like sort of, these are the distributions of actually the those particular scores from 1921 to, uh, 1922 to 2011. Well, we also have data about the music itself. So we have things like a text vector space. So things that, how similar are certain words, how, if you're talking about a bunch of text files, we had a visualization project call, uh, called Project Gadfly that never got off the ground, but it was still interesting. All the Hansard transcripts, every single thing that's said in the House of Commons is recorded and transcribed. They're freely available online. You can actually do a text analysis of those transcripts to find out um, you know, how incendiary the comments are, what the topic of the comments were. You can do some kind of text analysis of what people have said and patterns with what they've said. This is a very machine learning kind of thing. The question is, how do you get people to make informed decisions as an electorate using those, these data? So we have a text vector space, we have a music vector space, we have all sorts of different kinds of spaces. It doesn't necessarily have to be just raw numbers. But if we can map it into some kind of high dimensional space, we then need to flatten it down. And the so here's the music network from 2012. This is us flattening down all these various uh, types of music, all these various artists and how they're related to one another. So PJ Harvey's related to Radiohead, for example. Uh, we can do a number of different things. One of us is just a straight up projection. It is like I have this high dimensional space and I shine a flashlight and I'm just seeing what's on the wall. The shadow cast by shining a flashlight through this. That is just a straight projection. It is a linear projection of that space. You just remove all these other dimensions. You just flatten it down. We're also going to say there's other ways. There's non-linear ways where we just sort of squish down the dimensions in some kind of format. And that's like packing a trunk where you just sort of squish everything. But no matter what you do, you're going to lose information. Well, if you go from you know a 20 dimensional space down to two, something has to give. And so the question is, are you just throwing away dimensions or are you squishing dimensions? So here's at least two of our approaches. There's, other, there's one other approach as well that I'll just talk it out. So we can align the dimensions. This is, you find the primary dimension, the one that best describes the data, and then you find dimensions that are orthogonal to it. So you get eigenvectors, you get sort of uh, perpendicular vectors to one another. However many dimensions you need, you find the best dimension to describe the data, and then you find a dimension that's orthogonal, right angle to it, to that dimension. So if you take one dimension that best describes the data, or a bunch of dimensions that describe the data as one, uh, you can pretend it's one dimension, and then you find something that's orthogonal to that, and then you find something that's orthogonal to that until you, until you run out of dimensions to describe this. So you're looking for the best bang for your buck dimension to describe your data, and then you look for the next bang for your buck dimension that is not related to the first one, and then you find the next dimension that best describes your data that's not related to the other two. Um, and so any dimensions that are correlated automatically get simplified. If uh, the uh, rate of diabetes is correlated with, uh, with let, let's say, let's, I think this is true, the rate of diabetes is correlated with 
the uh, socioeconomic status. Okay, so if you are make if you make less money, your rate of diabetes actually increases. So you could represent other socioeconomic status or the rate of diabetes. Both of those dimensions, though, would be you just represent one of those dimensions. The other one can be either thrown away, or you can combine the two of them together. That would be one dimension. There's another approach that we're going to look at, which is just squish it all down, like packing a suitcase. This is how I pack a suitcase. This is how my wife packs a suitcase. She organizes things. I just stuff things in and just jump on top of it, right? You're trying to find the lowest energy state. You stuff everything in there, jump on top of it, hope things don't go smush. Good enough, right? It is when you squish a suitcase like this, you are forming the least energy state for the system. Everything gets squished down in one way or the other, but it will, it'll get there. You don't know any rhyme or reason to your data. You cannot infer anything about the data. It doesn't have the original structure, but it's the minimum amount of energy used to keep the system in, in place. We'll look at this again later on, but we also have one other thing, which is a manifold det det detection approach, which is you try and find the overall shape of the data, and then you do a dimensionality reduction to try and preserve that shape. So that's a manifold detection approach. They're also related to one, all of these are sort of related to one another. So one of the things as a trade-off you have to figure out is, do you want to try and keep global information? Do we want to keep something about the overall structure? Or do you need to worry about individual local connections? For a lot of things like music, you want to keep individual local connections, but you also still, like party vote, you still want to know what the global structure is. Uh, so global structure will give you something like I have categories of music and they make sense. Some people, some groups may be in the wrong category, but close enough, they're good categories versus I need these two things to look similar to one another. So the song beautiful now, whatever song it rips off, cause I cannot for the life of me figure out what song beautiful now sounds like, but it sounds like another song I know. Uh, I want those two songs to be right next to each other, right? I want, um, let me think of a good example. I can't think of a really, I, there's a lot of sonic similarity songs, but um, two groups that I think are, you know, that are similar to one another, they should be positioned approximately the same in this space. Or two songs that are similar to each other should be positioned approximately the same in this space, irrespective of what the genres are or how everything else has moved around. That's a local pres preservation. Right. Two songs that are similar should be the same, should be near each other. But if this song is very different from another one, I don't care how far off it is from the from the one I'm comparing it to. So isomaps, which we're going to look at, are local neighborhood preserving. They normally keep similar songs similar. Pr uh, principal component analysis is global. It is figuring out what dimensions are important and then mapping everything to those dimensions. But it squishes and moves around the data all at once. It's the data as a whole, this pattern of the data as a whole is saved, but on an individual uh, data point by data point basis, things get moved around all over the place. It doesn't keep the neighbors that you have on a high dimensional space are not the neighbors you have at a low dimensional space. But effectively, one has to be sacrificed. You either keep your neighbors your neighbors, or you keep the global view um, one or the other, but you can't keep both. So uh, let me think of a, see if I can come up with a COVID example for this one. Um, do I have a COVID example of this one? If we want to look at factors or dimensions describing uh, COVID symptoms, a PCA analysis would show you general patterns or what dimensions are important for COVID-19. Versus if you're trying to find out what patterns or what particular data points are um, people that have um, diabetes and people that have uh, you know certain COVID morbid, uh, morbid conditions if those are correlated to one another you want to keep if you want to see what other conditions are related to this particular condition that you have you would want to keep local neighborhood data um, the music example similarly was pca will give you here are the general dimensions how you can measure all music the iso map or the local preserving uh, approach would say these songs are similar these individual songs are similar I don't care what the overall structure of the data is I want the local 
what songs are similar it's a good uh, it's good for lo what songs are similar to this this is what dimensions are important for music so a linear dimensionality reduction is I choose particular dimensions so that's what PCA does I choose what dimension is important that best describes the data best describes the range of my data so this is the PCA is I find the range the, the dimension that that has the biggest range for my data that describes its most diverse uh, values for my data okay then I say okay that's fine find another dimension that's unrelated to this dimension I found so I find this dimension here this is the best description right so here's my data points These are all over the place here and then I find another dimension that best describes but it's orthogonal to the first one it's a 90 degree angle and if I want another dimension I put another dimension out here going this way right I keep on I can add another dimension but they're always not related to the first dimension they're unco not correlated with the first dimension every single time i new add a new dimensional a dimension and so this is effectively dimensional re uh, reduction via correlations they are uncorrelated dimensions and i just keep on adding another dimension one after the other until i don't want to have any more dimensions non-linear dimensionality reduction some things like uh, multi-dimensional scaling uh, in general isomaps manifold det and manifold detection techniques are there they do not keep everything related to one another one item might just shoot off into an another direction other stuff will stay approximately in the same place not all data moves at the same rate or same by the same amount and then after that we're going to look at how can we just keep all the data if we don't want to throw things out and so that's a different thing that we're going to look at like scatter plot matrices so I want to find the correlation between different dimensions and I want to remove aggregate dimensions that are highly correlated that's what PCA does um, so I find a dimension that best describes the data uh, I find two plus um, dimension two and I later have to be an eigenvector not correlated to the original so I keep on finding uncorrelated dimensions and if this is actually an ortho uh, orthogonal linear transformation it's actually you can actually mathematically map out this transformation there's no like choosing things there's no move, wiggling things around it's just a transformation of the data from one dimension uh, some dimensions to another you as a mathematical matrix um, but at the end of the day here's one uh, here's one of the interesting things about PCA at the end of the day whatever dimensions I have I may not be able to put words to it if you're a machine learning person that's fine but if you're an HCI person, eef, right? I do a PCA analysis on a bunch of um, music, let's say, and the most important dimension that I'm showing here means, I don't know, it's not the you know, number of beats per minute. It's not some n factor or some number that I can you know, put my finger on. It is, this is dimension X. What does it do? I don't know. It's related to beats per minute and the song title. It could be anything. It's not necessarily something I could put a simple label on because it's choosing, finding the dimension that best describes the data. And those could be a combination of different dimensions that are but seem, seemingly unrelated dimensions. Manifold detection, by the way, if you want to look at mu maps, for example, a uh, uniform manifold, uh, manifold approximation and projection, you, or UMAP, um, it finds and tries to preserve general structure of the data. And it's nonlinear and it's a bunch of crazy math here but what you would expect to get is approximately this conical shape in a two-dimensional space and get a feel for it PCA will not give you that because it's conical it will give you I don't know if actually what it ended up giving I think it spreads it sprays it out actually gives you some weird out, uh, output but you're trying to get keep that shape what is essentially a three-dimensional shape and you're trying to put it in two-dimensional space and like squishing your stuff in a, in a suitcase if you take a big bunch of stuff and you squish it into a tiny little suitcase something's going to break something's going to get squished multi-dimensional scaling so this finds the overall shape and then tries to preserve it multi-dimensional scaling if you have a chance to look at it it's like if i let's pretend these little yellow parts are springs they might actually be springs uh, or something that's stretchable Imagine a whole bunch of springs connected to all these various data points. 
if each one of these data points is connected to every other data point and you squish this thing down, like squish this model down into two dimensional space, what happens? It means everything gets pushed off into all sorts of different directions, but all the springs are pulling and pushing all at the same time. And eventually, this structure will eventually form its lowest energy position. It'll be some kind of shape in two dimensional space. So I take this, this model and I squish it down flat. Or take uh, roadkill, sorry to, to be disturbing here, but take roadkill. If you see a, you know, an animal that's been squished flat, that's what, <laughs> that's what effectively it's doing to a certain extent, right? It is, what is this three dimensional thing squished down into effectively two dimensional space? It forms its lowest energy position, whatever that ends up being. Uh, so what we end up doing here is uh, we take a subset of the data, uh, of the data items. So we cannot. We're trying to map n n minus one dimensions. If I have n elements, essentially the distance between all these other elements, I need n minus one dimensions for that. I take n minus one dimensions and I squish it down to k dimensions, some smaller number of dimensions. What I do is I place some number of elements in this k dimensional space. I then find the lowest energy position for all these things. I move these things around until it forms the lowest energy position, the best layout possible for these x items. Oh, sorry, these this subset of items. So it's a bit of wiggle until I get a, finally I get this nice stable state. I wiggle an item, see if it stabilizes. I wiggle another item, see if it stabilizes. So I keep on wiggling these little items until it gets to some uh, flat space. So it might be something like this. There we go. And so I'll wiggle around an item like this and then see if the rest of the items have to move. Then I'll add a new item. Uh, and I'll add it just somewhere in the space and then wiggle everything around again until it flattens out. And then I'll add another item. Then I'll just keep on adding items one after the other until this thing and, and stabilizes this thing. And I'll add another item and stabilize this thing. Until I finally get a stable multi-dimensional space, a, a, a stable space with all these items. This means items will be just strewn about in no rhyme or reason. If they were supposed to be together, they may not be together later. But generally, from a universal standpoint, it's approximately the best fit for the data in that space. And this algorithm is actually order n log n, so it's Pretty, pretty good algorithm. You can even go one step further. This is a system called MD steer, in case you want to know where the interaction side of things is. MD steer takes really, really large data sets, tries to do multi-dimensional scaling, but that's too slow. So the workaround is you take a, you can manually choose a particular subset of the data that you want to look at. You're going to say, I'm going to take this region right here, and then I'm going, then it will focus, it will only do the multidimensional scaling on that particular region with that subset of the data points. And then you take another chunk of the data points and then you do multidimensional scaling on that. And you keep on doing that, find, with like you as a user choosing what part to focus your multidimensional scaling on. And so as I keep on, you know, selecting different regions of this scaling space, it allows me to relatively quickly convert from a high dimensional space into a low dimensional space, and you as a human are actually guiding this multi-dimensional scaling. Hence, it's called MD steer. You're steering the scaling. Uh, these are the kinds of things that come up when it comes to scaling where you want a human in the loop because if you just randomly just throw numbers at this, it may not always give you the right answer. And you can say, I want to focus all my attention on this subset of the data set. Uh, Isomap sort of has trumped most of this multidimensional scaling now because it does something similar to MDS. What it does is it takes the shortest distance from your data point to its nearest neighbors. So you take the k closest neighbors and you compute the, di you compute the distance for each of those such points. So I get something like, here's my dot, here are my neighbors. Okay, not the entire data set, just you know, in this case, four nearest neighbors. I compute the distance for each of those points. And then what we do is we try and maintain these four connections, not n different connections. So I have a much smaller subset of 
of springs. It actually looks closer to this thing here. This is connected to these green dots, not all the dots, but just these green dots all around. So when I do the multidimensional scaling, what ends up happening is I get an approximate global shape, but I keep local features. So I do the same kind of algorithm where I'm trying to minimize the amount of the lowest energy format for my data, but I'm keeping only local connections around me. And then after at the end of the day, it's still n log n, and it gives a pretty good output. I think I have an example of here. So here's isomap right here. Here's principal component analysis. I don't know what LLE is, but it's another multidimensional scaling technique. Here's the original data set. It's a three-dimensional data set with and you can see the patterns within the data set. If I just map it straight to two-dimensional space, it looks uh, about like this, or I think this might be ideal. So you can see that each format will actually change or give you a different response. Um, at the end of the day though, most of these techniques, just look it up on your own. I wanted to point out that we have at least three different ways of viewing the data where you have to worry about whether preser preserving globally and you want to think about that whether you want to preserve locally whether think about that you may not be able to do both at the same time or you have to find some com compromise between the two because you can't have really truly have both and you also want to see if you keep some kind of manifold or some kind of structure to the data the overall shape does the overall shape here stay or am i just keeping that this these red dots are similar to each other afterwards is it globally the best shape? Or is, does it keep the general shape? Or do we just keep these local neighbors near each other? And that gives you different answers. It gives you different things. So something to think about if you're trying to do high dimensional space in a visualization later on. We could also say, screw it, all this multidimensional scaling and say, just let's keep it all. But in order to keep it all, you need to actually have interactivity. There's no way around it. So I think this becomes a link, but maybe not. No, nope, it's not. Um, you can look up regression cubes if you want to see some videos on this sort of thing. Keeping interactivity means I will keep all my data set and I'm only looking at a perspective of my data set at a time. I look at the number of beats per minute and the song amplitude in one, uh, you know, for all my music. And then I switch it up and I say, I'm going to look at the song title and the artist name in another set of dimensions. And then I rotate things around. I'm still looking at the same data set. I'm just looking at a, di I'm doing different projections of the same data set over and over and over again. But that interactivity or connecting these different views of the data set gives me other things that I can't get with. Multidimensional scaling says, here's what it looks like now. I squished it. This thing is, I'm gonna look at it from different viewpoints. So if I have a three-dimensional object, instead of trying to squish it, to do dimensional space, I say, I'm gonna have a view of this, I'm gonna have a view here, I'm gonna have a view here, I'm gonna have a view on this other side. I'm gonna have different perspectives of that same different, uh, yeah, of that same thing. So a uh, an architectural drawing does that sort of thing, right? I have different perspectives of that house or that building, so I have a better sense of how it looks versus trying to squish it down to two dimensional space. The, equi the equivalent to, um, two-dimensional space, there's a bunch of in, uh, engineering drawings where they actually try and represent all this three-dimensional space in two dimensions uh, as, as, and I'm trying to remember what, this, uh, what the term of it is. Oh, I'm blanking on the term for it. I'll look it up uh, and send you and uh, revise the video in a second. So there are well-established rules for this sort of thing, but different perspectives gives you maybe a bit more of an organic view of things. And one of the things we can do is looking at a bunch of multiple different views at once, or allow you to change the view as you go and change which dimensions on the fly that you're looking at. One of the key parts is though, that you need to link up these different things. You need to combine, if I have this perspective and this perspective, when I select items here, they show up here. We'll be seeing that when we look at brushing. And one other thing, one other approach you can take is what's called a node link diagram. So most of you hopefully will have seen one of those, but we'll look at that in a second. So here is a scatter plot matrix. So this is diabetic uh, data set. I think this is actually from Cody Dunn at Northeastern. 
the one of the reasons that we're looking at this is his son is actually diabetic and he sort of he went deep diving into diabetes and how you can visualize it and help people with diabetes control and monitor their insulin and so what you want to look at is if i have a whole bunch of different dimensions how do you do it how do you show all those dimensions well you show each dimension each pair of dimensions individually so here's dimension one here's dimension two here's three four five six seven here's one two three four five six seven so this is dimension one and two this is dimension one and two and the other x and y's are flipped notice this becomes this is the same dimension across this line so you don't show it at all and these are just mirror images of one another it forms a matrix and this way I can see how the different dimensions correlate and I can just see them all at the same time much like our dyna oh, uh, dynamic queries are coming up actually soon um, when we look at dynamic queries we'll be seeing this again the the fact of the matter is people are re if you have to manually make a graph and then look at it and make another graph and look at it our our uh, attention to detail but our, our memory is really terrible in a lot of ways so putting things right next to each other allows you to compare you can't do this by manually making these graphs and then looking them at them one after the other you put them side by side if you really want inferences or show the connectivity between the two so I would like to have a, a quick look at some of these things so this is choosing dimensions or choosing a subset of the data uh, and just because I think these are cool looking things so um, so one of the things we can do when we talk about brushing and linking I can choose a subset of the data in one visualization and it shows up and is highlighted in the other visualization so you see what the connection between these data sets are when we're looking at filtering and aggregation we're going to see the same sort of thing where when I remove from one I remove from the other um, but have a look at slice drop and just play around with it this is allowing you to look at I think one of the things is a brain scan of a 14 year old healthy adolescent uh, so they did a CT scan recorded the data and you can play around with what the brain anatomy looks like and you can explode it and you can do slices and you can do all sorts of cool things but it gives you different you can do different perspectives of that brain so you can compare different viewpoints and notice it's a high dimensional higher dimensional space but you are only showing it in 2d and you have their workarounds for three-dimensional data in 2d um, same with this uh, Goom interactive human project which allows you to do a scan of the human body and you know this is a slice of the human body and what the body looks like so if you're squeamish though uh, maybe don't but <laughs> I think it's fascinating and I think fine or almost finally um, here is uh, node link diagrams notice with a node link diagram because space doesn't matter because I'm putting this here I have just saying there is a connection between these two and I'm saying how much of a connection there is but there there is a connection between these two as long as I'm only showing nearby elements this becomes that same kind of squishing of springs problem laying out things laying out a node link diagram is actually an open research problem but it's always consistently shows connections and what this item is connected to so rather than try and force it into two-dimensional space you just say well it's a node link diagram you can show all the connections all the time you can also use an adjacency matrix to show connections between different data points and so you can show all the dimensions all the time but it doesn't it by just essentially throwing out the spatial data so this is or at least the spatial connections between the data points this is just yet another way you can show all the dimensions all at once if you've never seen a no lake diagram we're gonna look at those again more so I would like you to do a brief thing hopefully if you I uh, will have to warn people that there is an activity in here um, I want you to look at tweet visualizations not actual tweet visualizations but consider Twitter a tweet, a tweet has text it may have links it may have tags it may have images what type of data do you have how do you qualify the dimensions or quantify the dimensions um, different or how do you figure out what the text says you can pretend whatever you want when it comes to text analysis for example but Consider two ways of visual, at least two ways of visualizing the relationship between, te between tweets for any for an individual and maybe between people. 
and what dimensionality reduction technique would you take? Because this is actually a extremely big, a large dimensional space. So draw out a couple sketches, combine it with other topics we've looked at, like filtering data or what kind of what kind of data we're looking at. But I want you to just try and play around with how you could do visualize tweets and how they're related to one another, uh, and then upload that to the drive to see, and we'll see what people have. So hopefully this will make sense for in terms of the various types of multidimensional scaling we have. Do we worry about local or do we worry about global? What's the use of this particular system? And what kind of data are we looking at? Okay. Uh, so I like doing a little take home lesson before we stop here. So in terms of reducing di and dimensionality, we can find the key dimensions, which is like PCA. We have dimensional aligning. We choose which are the important dimensions and map everything, just project everything onto those dimensions. We can, we can sort of squish everything and look for manifolds and look for, uh, for shapes and try and just squish the data, but keep things connected to one another. Local connections are, are maintained. Uh, or we could just try and keep all of the different dimensions and just show different perspectives. And that's how we, we were selecting different dimensions at once. So these are just basic projections. Every single one of those has a trade-off and all of them have side effects. The question is, what side effects and trade-offs are you consciously going to be choosing? If you consciously choose that and you're writing up a report and you're using some kind of dimensionality reduction technique, explain why you're using one technique or another. Why did you use the global way versus the locally preserving way? The algorithms themselves are complex, they're computationally expensive, they're another class. But the key is that just to keep in mind how you, how you look at these systems and find the right tool for the job, okay? When we come back next time, we're gonna look at inferential, inferential statistics, and then after that, we're gonna look at, very briefly, at some machine learning. All right, thanks everyone.